Educational reform became a major social issue in the United States as a result of the Supreme Court case Brown v. Board of Education. The Brown v. Board of Ed case of 1954 stated that racial segregation in American schools was a direct violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution. The reforms of Brown created a surge of events that not only addressed the broad social issues of educational reform and equality of education, but also forced this country to examine and uphold the constitutional belief that all men are created equal. The idealistic concept of separate and equal schools didn't really exist before the Brown case. Schools that black students attended were separate, but they were substandard and inherently unequal, with poor facilities and limited or outdated supplies. Separate but equal meant separate, but it never meant equal. It meant that the white children would have what most of us think of as a school with four walls, bricks, blackboards, all of the equipment, all of the things you need to have a good school, and black children were going to a tar paper shack. The reaction to the Brown versus Board of Ed case brought to the surface deep-seated anger and fear in areas where segregation was mandated by law. This was especially evident in Little Rock, Arkansas, and the people's reaction in Little Rock shocked the nation and the world at large. These niggas ain't got no business in this school. I'll tell you right now, keep them niggas on their own school. This reaction led to a turning point in American history that changed the fabric of education and provided unprecedented access to learning and educational opportunities for black children. In 1951, a class action suit against the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas was filed by a man named Oliver Brown on behalf of his daughter Linda and 12 other parents of the local school district. For 60 years, America had allowed schools to be segregated, claiming that the separate facilities were equal and therefore, despite being separate, did not violate the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. The clause stated that no state shall deny to any person the equal protection of the laws. The Brown case declared that state laws that established separate public schools for black and white students were inherently unconstitutional. This decision overturned an earlier related case from 1896 the Plessy v. Ferguson decision, which decided that state-sponsored segregation was legal. In the Plessy case, Homer Plessy, a man who was only one-eighth black, was not allowed to sit in the whites-only section of a train car. The court ruled that even though Plessy was not allowed to sit in the train car of his choice, he had been given an equal seat in the black car, and thus the concept of separate but equal was satisfied. The Brown v. Board of Ed case overturned the Plessy ruling, ostensibly saying that racial segregation was a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. On May 17, 1954, the Supreme Court, led by Justice Earl Warren, handed down a unanimous decision stating that separate educational facilities are inherently unequal thus paving the way for integration of schools in the United States. In August of 1954, in the wake of the Brown decision, the NAACP petitioned the Little Rock School Board for immediate integration of schools. Several black students were given the opportunity to be the first to attend the well-respected Little Rock Senior High School which was eventually renamed Central High. Of the total 17 students that originally applied to attend Central High, only nine students eventually ended up attending the school, with many students dropping out because of the fear of violence and retaliation. Despite the mandate from the federal government to integrate the schools, the local school board of Little Rock, Arkansas, and the governor of that state, Orville Falbus, were unwilling to allow the black students to attend their all-white schools. You think of what is happening, and will you go to the school if no? No, sir. We definitely will not. The minute they walk in, they walk out. 
And it's not right. They have schools just as good as ours. It won't be they don't have to go to ours. They a choice, but we don't have a choice like they do. See, they can go to ours or they can go to their own, but we have to go to one school. We have rights, too. Negroes aren't the only ones that have a right. Governor Fallis, once considered a moderate on race relations, was instrumental in pandering to white fear and was a catalyst for much of the unrest that ensued in reaction to the reforms of Brown. Eventually, Falbus called in the Arkansas National Guard. Their role was not to protect, but rather to keep the nine students from entering Central High. Governor Falbus eventually found himself in direct conflict with President Eisenhower, who reluctantly called in 1,200 members of the 101st Airborne Division to protect the rights of the nine black children who were attempting to exercise their rights to a quality education at Central High. On September 4, 1957, eight of the nine students met at the home of Daisy Bates, a local American civil rights activist. She made a plan the night before to have all the students arrive together on the first day of school. One student, Elizabeth Eckford, whose family did not have a telephone, did not get the message that the other eight students were meeting beforehand. So, on that fateful day, Elizabeth rode the bus to school alone and was met by an angry, jeering crowd that called her names, spat on her, and threatened her. News cameras and photographers were everywhere that day, but there is one picture in particular that came to represent the incident to the world. The picture of Elizabeth Eckford with her back to an advancing crowd with one young white woman screaming at her. This young white woman was just another teenager, Hazel Bryant, whose life was very similar to Elizabeth Eckford's, but different entirely. Because of her race, she had unconditional access to a quality education. In hindsight, it does not seem surprising that the people of Little Rock reacted the way they did to the educational reforms laid out by the Brown decision. The reforms, with one stroke of the pen, attempted to correct years of social injustice and inequality of education and opportunity. The legacy of Elizabeth Eckford walking alone through a sea of angry white protesters to attend a better school is clear. She and the other members of the Little Rock Nine met with a wall of prejudice, ignorance, and intolerance. The lessons of the Little Rock Nine and the constitutional issues raised by the Brown vs. Board of Ed case are a powerful lesson in the complicated area of social reform in America and an affirmation that America would not tolerate separate educational facilities that were inherently unequal. The effect of the landmark Brown vs. Board of Ed decision rippled through the fabric of American educational reform and social structure. Due to these reforms, blacks were eventually able to gain access to the best education in the schools of their choice. They were able to live where they wanted and get jobs based on their qualifications and not the color of their skin. They were even able to run for elected office. Because nine black children were willing to endure the humiliations of Central High, other children of color that followed them had access to equal education under the law. Separate but equal could not withstand the tide of change. The Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment eliminated racial discrimination in Little Rock schools, thus paving the way for integration of all schools in the United States, and eventually led to the equalization of rights under the law in all other areas of American life. The colors we see today are not based on skin tone, but on the clothes of the Little Rock Nine.